So let's talk about 3D tracking. There are a lot of different ways to 3D track things, and there's a lot of different ways to use this information. It's really good for hard body or architectural tracking. It works well on most shots that have camera movement. Occasionally you can have too much camera movement where your motion blur is starting to streak things out, or your rate of rotation might be too fast and it can't pattern match to create the track points to make a continuous camera move. But it's really good with, you know, pans and tilts and dolly and boom or any combination of them. Uh, it works a little different than a 2D tracker in that you can stabilize with it, but you're stabilizing locally, and that's based on an object in 3D space. It's also really good for a shot where you have lots of different things going on in different levels of depth. We'll take this shot for example. If you were tracking this traditionally, you would need to track at least four points on this sign if you wanted to do a corner pin. You would track another four points on this sign. You might need to do a few tracks on the background, some tracks on the fence. If you had some foreground objects, you'd be creating individual track points for those. And each of those would be their own, basically, node stack, where you're doing all the work for that individual node, and then you're having to apply tools to each of those individually, like defocus and motion blur, etc. 3D tracking is really nice because it lets us kind of combine those all into one space. It unifies them anyway, and it can help speed up that process, especially if you have a lot of different work going on in one shot. What it doesn't work so well for, like that shot above with the t-shirt, it doesn't work well on soft body shots or shots with lots of internal movement. Say you're shooting a, it's a big panning shot over a road with lots of moving traffic. You might have to do some work to actually map the traffic out because it's going to contaminate your 3D track. You can also run into some issues with fidelity because you have to go through a scan line process. It goes into 3D space and then has to come out of 3D space. Sometimes you can take a little bit of a quality hit. It's less, le less and less of an issue, especially if you're graining properly and you're applying the proper filter methods. The other thing that's kind of important about 3D tracking is it usually requires some level of visualization. You know, it's not like the tracker node or the vector node where you're, what you see is what you get. You have to view things in maybe a non-traditional way or work in 3D space or you're working with geometry. So it's a little bit more setup. So sometimes the payoff isn't there if the amount of setup you have to do, you might could achieve that with a different tool. There's a few different tools we're gonna use in 3D camera tracking. Obviously the camera tracker is an important one. And you can both track objects and world tracks. The camera tracker doesn't care. It's really just a matter of how you map things out and what your expected result is. Another tool that you can sort of faux 3D track with is the card 3D. And that's sort of a card and a scan line tool wrapped together. Sometimes it's really useful to use in lieu of a corner pin because it gives you more of a traditional 3D approach to manipulating that object. The other thing you're going to use are cards and geo. Nuke comes with a few pre-built geometry tools. Most of the time you're going to be using a card. Um, you might also be using the point cloud generator and generating your own meshes, or you could be bringing in geometry from third-party software. Lens distortion is also really important with 3D camera tracking. Almost all lenses have some level of distortion. Some are much worse than others, and it's really important to account for that. And a lot of I see a lot of people that don't, and they have issues with tracks where when an object gets near the edge of the frame or a panning shot where it's moving from one side to the other, they have issues getting the track to stick, and a lot of times that's actually a result of lens distortion not being used or not being set up correctly. And the other thing you're going to use is output, and that's a scan line render or array render. So let's look at this shot. We'll let it play. You can see we have quite a bit of parallax happening here. And then we'll open up our camera tracker tool. We'll view that. So I've already tracked this shot and you can see we've grabbed a bunch of different individual points here. It's worth noting that you can change some of the settings of how it grabs those features in our settings tab. We can also change a few settings here that are more relevant to the solve. From a tracking standpoint though, we would modify our settings before we do any tracking. We can set our number of features, our detection threshold. That's really kind of how unique the area is. By pulling this to the left, you'll tend to get more local definition and it's not as worried about repeat patterns. 
sometimes that can help give you more points in areas that are maybe not being represented as strongly as you want them to be. You can also turn on preview features and refine locations. That does a little bit of math under the hood and also shows you generally where it, it's going to start putting track points. You can also change some minimums. These are actually really useful because you can, before you start, set some defaults that are going to help exclude points that aren't going to be good for your track. So you have somebody walking through the frame or you have something moving quickly and it's only in there for a few frames, you can set your minimum length to a larger number than those frames and any tracks that are generated on that object that don't meet that minimum length requirement are categorically discarded. You can change some of your solving methods here. So in this case we have a free camera. If you are doing rotation only, and rotation only won't give you the traditional point cloud that you're expecting, it'll just give you a dome. Um, or you can change it to linear or planar and that just helps the solver know a little bit better what it's dealing with. Keyframe spacing, you can change that, smoothness. There's a few other display options here. You can read up on those in the manual. So we'll go back to our main tab. The important things here, usually range is important. A lot of times your footage comes in and the range you're working is your project setting, but sometimes you might need to modify that. Camera motion, this matches what was in our settings. Lens distortion, most of the time it's unknown occasionally, and if you're working on a, a bigger budget thing or you have a really robust VFX pipeline, you might actually have lens charts and you might have a known distortion profile for that lens. And in that case, you would use no distortion and you would undistort the image prior to piping it into the camera tracker. Focal length. So this is one where I actually see a lot of people go sideways on. The default is unknown constant, and that'll just try and figure out what that lens is as a fixed lens. What most people don't realize is when focus gets pulled on a lens, it's technically, you know, unless it's a really, really high-end lens, it's actually changing the focal length as well as the focus. So a lot of times just changing this to unknown varying or approximate varying can give you a little more accurate track result. Film back. This is important in the context of working with other assets and getting focal lengths that are accurate. It's a little less important for your everyday, I just need a track and I need to put a card in space. But if you do have certain information, this might be useful to plug in. So say you do actually know the lens, um, what length the lens is, having the appropriate film back becomes very important for having that lensing be correct. In my case, I shot with a A7 III, so I have set that as an A7 mirrorless. And it gives us our film back size in millimeters as well. So here's our tracking buttons. So this actually lets us track it and then say our shot lengthens or shifts one way or another, we can actually update that track or clear that track. And then once we've tracked, we'll use the solve button and then solve, update solve and clear solve work the same way as update track. Our error, this is a good way to tell how well our track is actually working. Typically, you want an error somewhere around one to one and a half or less on HD footage and somewhere under, you know, somewhere around three or four on 4K footage. It scales with your resolution, so that's something to be aware of. You're, you're not going to get a sub-1 track on 4K footage by nature of the size. Export is also really important. So here we can select which aspects of the camera tracker we want to export. And like I mentioned before, the camera tracker tool, it's very similar to the smart vector in that what it generates is information, but you still have to extract that information out of that tool to be able to meaningfully use it. So in this case, I've just exported a camera and a lens distortion node. But if we just pull this over to the side and I say export scene plus, this gives us everything. So you'll see we outputs a camera, a little point cloud, and these are all the points that we were seeing visualized here. If we were to open this, each of these is actually a point in a point cloud. And if we hit tab and switch over into 3D, we can see those points visualized from the camera node itself, the camera tracker node. Uh, just a simple scene, which is connecting all of these, our lens distortion. And in this case, we have very little lens distortion that it's calculating. And then it, go ahead, it goes ahead and connects a scan line render uh, with a background image. 
Typically, you're not going to use all of these or want all of these, but this is how you would extract them. And the other thing to note is link output means it's linking those tools with an expression back to the camera tracker node itself. As a rule, I try to not do that, and I'll talk about that again when we get to the keeping it clean aspect of this. Uh, another really useful tool for me is the point cloud generator, because what the point cloud generator does is it gives us an output like this. So now we can really see exactly what that is doing. And the point cloud generator uses two inputs. It uses a camera and a source, sources your footage, preferably undistorted if you have undistorted footage. And then it's using the camera you created from the camera tracker. There are a few options here for using this tool, a couple important ones, frame spacing. This is setting keyframes at a predetermined interval, or you can use the analyze sequence, which will set keyframes dynamically after viewing the, it'll after analyzing the footage. Or there's analyze sequence, which will set keyframes automatically based on some analysis it does under the hood. For the most part, I usually just set this to six or eight. I hit add all, and then you hit track points. So this will go through, it'll analyze each keyframe and then triangulate the images from keyframe to keyframe and that's what creates your dense point cloud. There's also a few options for viewing so you can display direct rejected points. I've actually already deleted my rejected points to make this a little friendlier to see. And then you can change some of your thresholds here to only give you the points you need. You can then delete them via this button and that will help kind of trim your point cloud up. A really another pro tip here that most people have never seen and never use is you have different selection modes in Nuke. So if you go to this menu here, you can actually go to vertex selection and you can select vertexes directly. And then you can right click if your tool is open. We'll pop it out. So say you want to select some tools like you just don't need these. You can right click and hit delete. You can also create groups and do some other work that will make little mini point clouds out of your main point cloud. But that's just one of those that most people don't know unless you read the manual. We'll just undo that real quick. But yeah, so really, really cool workflow here. You know, we can really see the details of the rocks. And this is super useful because you're gonna use this to place your geometry. Sometimes you can actually use this to create the geometry. I find it's better as a visualization tool. And that's what I was talking about earlier when I say 3D tracking requires visualization. This is one of those things you would do to visualize what your 3D track looks like and then use that to place cards in space. I also wanted to contrast that against a smart vector workflow, for example. So this is the same shot, just tracked with a smart vector. And I want to show how it starts to fall apart. So we have a we have a little box we've tracked right here. And you can see the error starting to be introduced into those vectors. And this is pretty clean footage. It is 8-bit, so it is a little bit noisy, especially, especially being S-Log3. But you can see how much error we're really starting to get in this footage. And this is why some workflows are better than others. You know, in this case, being structural and a fairly long shot, it's better to use a camera tracker for something like this or a traditional 2D tracker. Now, this also might be a case where the vector corner pin could be useful because you can start to reset once your error gets above a certain threshold. You can re-keyframe and that'll help sort of build that um, a little cleaner. But again, that's something, that's why it's important to sort of understand how all the different trackers work so that you can pick the one that's most appropriate for your shot.